Alleluia. Christ is risen. Many years ago, I was working as a chaplain in a hospital, and uh, I was attending to a family whose grandmother, they called her Nana, Nana was dying. She was very, very old, and she was very, very close to death. And they called for a chaplain, and so I went there, and I said prayers with them. And when we had finished all the prayers that I brought with me to, in my heart to say for her, uh, one of her daughters said, let's sing her that hymn, you know, the one that she loved so much. And now this was before COVID. So there was more than two people in the room. There were actually seven or eight family members in the room and they gathered around her table. Now, she was really far gone and it was, an, it was one of those deaths that takes place in an intensive care unit, and so she was all connected to all kinds of sensors, and you could just look on the monitor above her head and see what her heart rate was, and what her breathing was, and what her oxygen levels were, and all of this, and they were diminishing. It was clearly very, very close to the end. And her family gathered around her and they began to sing, all of them together. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Such a beautiful hymn. And they knew all the verses and they sang it together around her. Now, this particular song, it's actually an African-American spiritual, and it dates back all the way to the early 18th century. There's, there's actually a copy of a, a version of this song that was published in 1801. Um, so, as an African-American spiritual that was being sung probably well before it was actually published in, in print, in 1801, this would have been a song of oppressed people. This was a song being sung by people who are, were the most marginalized human beings in, in, in existence at their time. They were living terrible lives, and they needed the hope of Jesus and the hope of one another, and they found that in these beautiful spirituals that they sang together. Now, in, in the scriptures, we have, uh, there's, there's what's called apocalyptic literature, like the, the, the Revelation to John. That book is full of all of this really powerful, strange imagery. That was also something written by people who were enslaved and marginalized, right? And so in these, with, from these enslaved and marginalized, oppressed people, we get these beautiful expressions of art with these powerful images. Now, when that family started singing around Nana's bed, all of her vital signs improved. They all went up. Her breathing went up. Her heart rate went up. Her oxygen saturation went up. They all went up. It was, it was so clear that she was with them. And they saw that she was beginning to, I mean, even her skin pinked up. She got more more healthy looking, they surrounded her with love and they sang that song to her. Now, I've seen many deaths. I've been present with many people at the moment of their death. And I've been present with many families in the moments after someone they love has died. But rarely have I seen people so sure so relieved, so at peace as this family after singing that hymn to their nana. Now, this morning we heard the story of Mary and Peter and the beloved disciple, and Mary goes to the tomb, and it's empty. And the, what, what, does it, what occurs to her? She thinks, they've taken him. What have they done with his body? 
She went there to prepare his body for burial, to do the rites that were necessary. So she runs back to the other disciples and she says to them, they have taken the body. The tomb is empty. And they run back. Peter and the beloved disciple, they run back and there's a little foot race, right? And one of them gets there first, but he doesn't go in and the other one goes in first, right? I don't know what this is about, but they, they, they come away from this seeing of an empty tomb convinced that what Jesus had told them would happen has actually happened. He has risen. And they go running back to tell the rest of the disciples. But somehow Mary doesn't see that, okay? Mary's still there. She's still grieving. And they run away and she looks into the tomb and there are two angels in there. And they say, woman, why are you crying? And she just answers them like they were just a couple of dudes in the tomb, right? I mean, why are they there? She doesn't seem to be surprised or anything. She just answers them. They have taken my Lord, and I do not where, know where they have put him. And so then she turns around, and, and Jesus, the risen Christ, is right there. Her beloved is right there. And she looks, and, and, and she doesn't even recognize him. She, and she figures he must be the gardener. And so she says, he says to her again, woman, why are you crying? And she says, they have taken my Lord. And in that moment, somehow he, he sees that she doesn't get it. She doesn't see him for who he is. And he says her name. Can you imagine? She's lost him and then he's back and he says her name. This, there's such a love between these people and he says her name, Mary. And, and that breaks through. Somehow it breaks through and she sees that it's actually Jesus standing there. I don't know why she didn't recognize Jesus. I don't know why she didn't see those angels for something special, but she didn't. Now, maybe, maybe it was a cultural thing. Maybe as a woman, in, you know, she's out early in the morning, she doesn't know these people, she's not supposed to look at them, not supposed to look them in the eye, so she hasn't actually looked to see Jesus' face. And so maybe that's why she didn't recognize him. I, I don't know. But I think there's something else going on here. I think that this is something that we all have experienced. In fact, I think it's something we experience almost every day. And that, the thing is that the sacred is all around us. The sacred is present all around us all the time. God is present. God's Spirit is present. The beauty of creation is present. Just look out this window at these magnificent trees. Some of them 80, 90 years old. These, they're magnificent. They reach up into the sky so beautifully. Yes, the sacred is here, but we don't always see it. So, why is that? Why don't we see it? We do encounter the sacred. We might recognize the Christ in someone else in a moment of conflict when, when you break through that conflict and, and, and encounter one another. You find reconciliation and you think, I have encountered Christ in that other person. Or perhaps you see something special in someone else or something lovable in someone else and you think, ah, I have just seen that spark, that image of God, that sacred within them. There's, there's lots of different ways that we can see and actually know that we are seeing the sacred. Um, we can be moved by the grandeur of nature, a, a grand vista. A couple weeks ago, I was leaving Safeway, and I pulled out of the parking lot, and I looked over to my left, and there, in the, the front yard area of a preschool, were about 30 little kids, and they all were holding on to a, little, to a rope, okay, and they had like seven or eight teachers with them, and it was just all of these kids all lined up and holding onto their rope so they could go to the park or wherever it was that they were going together, and their faces were just lit up. They were beaming. And it just moved me. I, I just, I thought, 
There it is. There is the sacred. I have seen the sacred shining from those little faces as they move together, protected by their teachers. Sometimes we, have, we will encounter sacred in worship. Sometimes we will encounter it in art or music. As someone who sings in a choir, I love that experience that occasionally happens when we sing together and we harmonize and, and nobody has gone flat and the notes, the notes and the harmony soar higher than it ever could go without, the, the, without all of us singing our parts. It's a beautiful thing. Some people experience that sense of transcendence on a sports field. If you've played baseball or football or basketball and you've been with a team or any sport, soccer, and you've been with a team and you've worked well together and you've had that experience of doing something bigger together than what you could do alone, there's something there's a hint of, of, of a connectedness there. There's a hint of our relationship with one another, of a, of a connection that transcends our individual selves. But in the midst of struggle, we fail to see the sacred. In the midst of anxiety and stress, in, in the midst of fear and worry, it's really hard to see the sacred. In the midst of grief, I'm not even sure it's possible to see the sacred. When we are devastated by the loss of a loved one, as I'm sure that family was despite the, that beautiful moment at the end of Nana's life, they lost her in that moment. They were filled with grief. How can you see the sacred? Life throws so much at us. There are so many distractions. The, the distractions of, of media, the distractions of hurry. Hurry is a particular one that, that draws us away from any sense that we are connected to one another. No, I just have to get there. I need these cars to get out of my lane so I can go the, above the speed limit like I want to. Quit moseying. Let's go. All of this hurrying, all of this worry, all of the stresses of life, they, they, they diminish our ability to see and recognize the sacred around us. But sometimes, love and relationship break through. Sometimes, we are able to somehow see the sacred. And I don't think that it's because the sacred becomes more visible. I think the sacred is always there. I think that it, there are times when love or wonder or joy touch our hearts. And in that moment, it changes our ability to see. It changes our very capacity to recognize the sacred, the holy, the spirit around us. That's what happened with Nana and her family around the bed with her that night as they sang, there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. That balm is the love of God. And when we feel that love, when we experience that love, and we know that it is coming to us from God or from someone else, or when we give that love, when we express love and care for another, it changes our hearts. And that is the balm in Gilead. That is what allows us to see God, to see, to see the holy in others and even sometimes in ourselves. Now, I want to end this by just singing that beautiful refrain that the family sang to their Nana. And if you know it, I invite you to sing with me. There is a balm in Gilead 